Uh, welcome. Hi, uh, I'm I'm Alan. Uh, I'm an engineer at Protocol Labs. Um, I'm kind of new to NFTs. I guess we kind of all are really. Um, when I found out about them um, and I was getting interested in them, um, I was really happy to see that IPFS was being used to store them. So, um, for instance, if I go to this uh, NFT marketplace site, Super Rare, um, I can just kind of click through, have a look at any NFTs, for instance, maybe this one. Um, and if I go do a little bit of spelunking in the uh, Ethereum blockchain, um, I can just click through, have a look at the contract that was created for this particular NFT, paste in the uh, token ID and look, look here, it's an IPFS hash. Uh, and this URL is a URL on a uh, IPFS gateway. And I can just bring it up like that. Um, so that's super cool. Uh, NFTs stored on IPFS. Um, and um, NFTs, um, the actual artwork, so the image or the um, or the video or whatever it is that's that is the actual NFT thing is um is is stored usually off um off chain. And that's because it's prohibitively expensive to store um, a lot of data on chain. Um, and IPFS has some nice properties for off-chain data um, that we'll go into in a little bit. Uh, so um as I learned more, a little bit more about NFTs, I came to realize that actually the developers that were enabling uh, NFT creators, um, like uh, so marketplaces like Foundation, like um, Super Rare, like Zora, they they actually really cared about users being able to access their data should they ever actually disappear. Oof. So if they disappeared, they don't want that to happen. They don't want all of those NFTs that people have bought, created uh, out there to just suddenly also disappear. Um, and so IPFS really fits this building and it can actually help solve this problem. Um, and so it's really not surprising that it's being used, but in case you're kind of new to IPFS, let me just explain a little. So um, if you put data on an IPFS node, I've just chosen this little uh, little image of a, a complete random, it's an NFT, it's, a, it's like some generated mountains or something. Um, but, but if you put some data on an IPFS node, firstly, you get a content identifier, um, a CID. And um, CIDs are a kind of cryptographic hash, and they address the content, not its location. Um, and uh, it means that a given any given CID will always refer to the same piece of content. Or to put it another way, if the content changes, the CID for that content would change. Now, um, if we didn't store an, a CID on, on chain and use a regular URL, then that could be problematic. Like, the, the URL, um, the content at the end of the URL could be deleted. It could be removed by the owner. Like the domain could expire or the hosting perhaps expire and it could just disappear off the internet completely. Um, it also could be altered. So you could have like an image of a, a cat, which is your favorite NFT in the whole wide world um, that actually then someone came along and changed it to be an NFT of a dog. And, uh, and you'd be darn annoyed about that. Um, uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, also, like maybe maybe like a URL to um, to some content isn't accessible in your country. Maybe there's a, a big old firewall around your country that disallows you from accessing stuff. Um, so actually, you really need to be able to get things from uh, from other nodes and, and people and places that are uh, within that boundary. So IPFS can help there. Um, so uh, anyway, how does this uh, CID thing work? Well, um, if someone else requests that data by its CID, then um, then they'll receive it. Um, and now two nodes can serve the, the content. So that's super cool. It's kind of like this. Uh, so someone else can come along and uh, get the content. And it means the original node that had the content can actually go away. Uh, it's gone. Um, and the data will still be retrievable from the other nodes. There's caveats. Of course, there are two caveats to this. The caveat number one, uh, caveat number one is that um, if if all of the nodes that have the content go away, then nobody has the content. You can't get it anymore. Uh, so, uh, so we don't want that to happen. The second caveat is garbage collection. Uh, so depending on your configuration of your IPFS node, garbage collection may run at like a certain time um, when your configured repo storage limit is hit, if you put too much stuff in there, um, or it can be run um, completely manually. So there's like API, you can run it from the CLI um, as well. Um, so what you need to do is tell IPFS that this content is not garbage. So this is a super rare NFT. It's not trash. Don't throw it in the trash, IPFS. Um, 
so yeah, they, they are the caveats. Um, and so this, this concept of like telling IPFS that something is not trash um, is what's often referred to as pinning in, uh, in IPFS. And uh, if you don't pin that data, it'll eventually be garbage collected. So um, even if the content is super popular and lots of people have it on the IPFS network, then it could still eventually exit the network if, uh, if there's no one pinning it, um, if garbage collection runs. Um, yeah, so that could happen. And so these two, these two caveats are, um, are generally why developers use a third party service uh, like Pinata, like Textile, uh, like Fleek to store their content. Um, and, and, and that is because they have nodes that uh, are publicly available, stay online 24 seven, and they pin the content so that it doesn't disappear off the network. Uh, cool. uh, so uh, nft.storage. This is, this is the thing, it's a new thing that we've been working on, hooray. Um, if you came to the NFT hack, uh, the EVE Global NFT hack, then you might have uh, recognized some of this talk and even NFT storage. We, we built it originally for that, um, but we're, we're, we're launching it publicly now. And it's a place where you can store your, your off-chain NFT data. Um, and you can do that safe in the knowledge that it will be there tomorrow. Um, and it hopefully goes some way to solving that permanence problem. Um, and, uh, and it's free. Uh, it's free for as long as we can possibly make it free. Um, and the one of the big ideas is it just should be easy to, um, to, to store your data on IPFS. So um, how does it work? Well, uh, you upload your uh, NFT data, your off-chain NFT data to nft.storage um, and nft.storage stores that data on IPFS nodes, so uh, multiple nodes, so that's, that's good. Um, and okay, so far so good, but what is the difference between your regular pinning service? Well, um, behind the scenes, nft.storage is actually negotiating deals with uh, to store your data um, with miners on the Filecoin network. and. Um, the Filecoin network incentivizes miners to store data. They get paid to store data. And they also typically get paid when data is retrieved as well. So, uh, so why is that good? Well, um, if, uh, if NFT storage goes away uh, and every IPFS peer who ever fetched the content went away, uh, then the miners will still have the content because uh, we've made deals with them and they're miners. They're, they are mining on the network and they, they're, they're, they're here for the long haul. Um, and so you can think of the miners as just another set of IPFS peers with strong incentives to continue storing the data. Uh, and so yeah, NFT storage public launch is on Thursday. Um, hopefully, <laughs> if everything goes to plan, the URL is uh, nft.storage and the site is up now if you uh, want to go and take a look. We have a super simple HTTP API. We have clients in JavaScript, uh, Go, Rust, Ruby, Python, PHP, and Java. Uh, and we also have an open API schema. Um, so if uh, your, your favorite uh, programming language was not in that list that I just read out, then, um, then you should be able to generate a client in, uh, in that language relatively easily. Um, or just use the HTTP API directly. Um, so after launch, we're hoping to introduce a new metadata API, uh, which should make minting NFTs even easier. Uh, and, it, and it builds on um, a lot of those, um, those best practices that Youssef was talking about earlier. Um, and, uh, and later, we're also going to be introducing wallet auth, so uh, NFTs can truly be stored by content creators and not just by marketplaces be, uh, on behalf of them. Cool. Uh, so. We are also going to be starting our Save the NFTs initiative. Uh, we're going to crawl the Ethereum chain from their genesis, uh, and we're going to upload all the NFTs we find to nft.storage, so they'll be stored, stored. So no more will incredible artworks the people have already created be lost in the sands of time. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah. It's not just if Ethereum either. We're going to see if we can um, save NFTs that are on other blockchains. So. Um, and of course, we'll be visualizing all that data on nft.storage. Um, and uh, and we, we've got this awesome idea to create a new uh, NFT checker. Um, there's already an F NFT checker, but this would be a new different one uh, where you can um, query the health of your NFT. Um, and uh, so you, you could do stuff like see how many IPFS providers uh, for your NFT uh, there are. Like you could see details of the Filecoin storage deals um, of that NFT, like where it can, where it's, what, what miners are storing it and uh, what deals is it in. Um, and, and we'll obviously make all of those kind of uh, metrics available to developers over a uh, public uh, API. Uh, and um, I think that's about all I have to say, but thanks for listening. <laughs>